Hey you Stygian dogs, let's take a look at the new novel by S.M. Sterling named Blood of the Serpent, based on Robert E. Howard's Conan. First off, I think this is a great package. The dust jacket is satisfying enough. It certainly reads as fantasy, and it is clear that this is Conan. It is interesting how they rely on the Atlantean sword to represent Conan, though. For many fans, we started our Conan journey based on the Milius and Schwarzenegger version of the character. His acquisition of the sword is a pivotal moment in the film, as it cements Conan's freedom, both physically and, I guess, metaphorically. He smashes his shackles, and the next part of his adventure begins. But as fans that have continued to explore the tellings of Howard's Conan from the original stories and the comics, we understand that the movie's story is an anomaly. We know that Conan has always been free. He leaves Samaria of his own volition. The sword is inconsequential. Heck, as we know, Conan goes through swords like they're going out of style. He uses whatever weapon is at hand. It's, it's not some intrinsic part of his legend. It is but a myth about Conan. And viewed that way, I love it more deeply. But we find ourselves in this scenario where an incidental plot point in a hearsay version of Conan's legend has become synonymous with the hero. And I suppose justly so, if only because of the popularity that the Schwarzenegger performance generated for the character. But it's not relevant to Robert E. Howard's Conan. While it will likely continue to be a part of the brand's marketing, and I guess it's pretty cool looking, it's ultimately unimportant. So, my Atlantean tangent aside, I was very pleased to see what was underneath the jacket. I really like the embossed bronze foil sword on the cover along with the text on the spine. It's worth noting the emphasis on Conan on the spine. The novel title and author name are secondary. It's Conan that's important here. After all, I'd say that the release of this novel marked the relaunch of Heroic Signature's Conan and serves also as promotion for the forthcoming comic and other ventures. In addition to this wonderful map of the Hyborian Age, a particular design highlight is the inclusion of illustrations by Roberto de la Torre. I can't say enough about how wonderful these are. His style adds a certain gravitas to the novel. If Sterling's prose doesn't precisely emulate Robert E. Howard's style or the writing of Howard's time, the illustrations, to me, make this feel like I'm reading something from a different era. You might glean my enthusiasm for De La Torre from my other videos, so I'll rein that in a little, except to say his illustrations are a worthy companion to visualizing the Hyborian Age. So, the story itself is contained in the first 300 pages, and as a bonus we get the text for the original Howard story, Red Nails. The new story, Preceding Red Nails, was written by S. Sterling. He's said to be most known for his novels of the Change series, and while I've not read his work before, his name is familiar to me from scanning the fantasy sci-fi section of bookstores, and I'm happy to say that his prose was fantastic, approachable, and engaging. I'll certainly check out his other works. I won't give a synopsis of the story. Suffice to say, it serves as a prelude to Howard's Red Nails addressing how Conan first meets Valeria and filling in the blanks on the events leading up to and briefly referenced during Conan and Valeria's reunion in Red Nails. Now, before starting Blood of the Serpent, I had reread Red Nails. I wanted to refresh myself on the story itself and be able to contrast the new story against Howard's style. I'd say that it's apparent that Sterling does not attempt to emulate Howard's bombastic brevity. This didn't bother me in the least, and while I noticed this distinct difference in style upon beginning Blood of the Serpent, upon its conclusion I continued reading the first quarter or so of Red Nails and felt that Sterling's style did, after all, nicely merge into the classic story. Seeing reviews online, it would seem that one criticism of the work is that, well, Blood of the Serpent isn't really a story unto itself. I think this might be a fair criticism if you isolate Sterling's work from Red Nails. If viewed in that light, it's true, it wasn't really self-contained, it was a lot of this happened, and then this happened, and this happened, and you know that by the end, Conan is going to meet up with Valeria. But I think it's best to think about the book by not separating Sterling's excellent contribution to the story, but to view it as a cohesive whole, where the depth and elaboration throughout Sterling's portion serves as a nice intro to Red Nails as action-packed denouement. So, I'll be honest, this is my first reading of a Conan pastiche novel, and I had a great time with it. Uh, didn't want to put it down. I was very satisfied with the action sequences, the overall immersion of locations, the detail given to the more mundane realities of Hyborian existence. For example, those who have read it will know what I mean when I say you learn a lot about meals, the consistency of local beverages, hunting tactics, and descriptions of the flora and fauna in the various encountered climatic zones. 
This filling out of the world is what was satisfying to me. It provided a sense that I was meandering in this world and spending time with my hero. This is, in some ways, contrary to Howard's writing style, where he somehow seems to be able to just eject the sense of place and surroundings into your head with limited yet vivid text. Sterling elaborates, lingers on things, further cementing time and place. The Conan that Sterling gives us in this book is a worldly Conan, still brutal in his potential for violence, but he's worldwise, understands and comments on the vastness and difference of the Hyborian world and its myriad cultures. True to who he is, moral in his way, yet cognizant that not all are the same. Yes, he judges the civilized, but he's able to reflect on human difference and not arrogantly so. He is a unique person, having seen more of the world than almost any of his contemporaries that he encounters. I was most reminded of the Conan we see in Beyond the Black River. The various chronologies place Red Nails either just before or just after this story. From an age perspective, he's thought to be somewhere between 35 and 39, likely just before he takes the Aquilonian crown. So his ultimate ascendancy is the result of his keen intelligence and instincts. And he is above petty differences, confident in who he is in the context of the world around him, while retaining a healthy distaste of the sorcery of those Stygian dogs. Um, Sterling gives us, I think, my favorite Conan, at least period-wise. My consumption of Conan has been really intense over the past year or so, moving between Howard's original stories and the various comic book versions, back and forth, all over the place, and as a sort of continuum. So reading this as my first pastiche felt like reading a bunch of savage sort of Conan issues in a row, and I loved this aspect. It allowed me to spend time with a favorite hero, to dwell in and become intimate with his reality, his thinking, his world. The world and the Conan that S.M. Sterling gave us felt authentic to me, and it serves the purpose of Titan books and heroic signatures in that it makes me want more Conan. So it's a foretaste, a tease, an elaboration of one of the most timeless characters, and it makes me want more. Whether a fan or new to the character, I'd encourage you to check it out, and I do hope you enjoy it. A final thought too. Following Red Nails, there is a disclaimer or incantation of sorts presented as an afterword. In earlier drafts, I'd optimistically termed it a call to mindfulness. Out of eagerness, I had encountered it before beginning the book. I was excited to poke around at the contents and get a sneak peek before beginning the novel proper. It reads as follows. Red Nails is pure Howard, restored from his original manuscript. Raw and powerful, it's also very much of its time. Written almost a century ago, when our culture could be less socially aware and genre fiction in particular often exhibited rough edges, some of today's readers may find jarring. Yet this is seminal fantasy by a writer whose work Stephen King has called so highly charged that it nearly gives off sparks. Rather than alter it in any way, we've chosen to offer it in its original form for the reader to experience. I'll say that my first impression really was that it was generally a benign statement, devoid of any particular meaning. There was an obviousness to it that was, well, it struck me as terminally boring that readers needed to be reminded that a story first published about 87 years ago might reflect different attitudes than those of today. At least they had the decency to present it as an afterword, I thought to myself. Yet, however inert I've become to such statements, here we are. If the materials are jarring to some readers, well, either reader should then at least know what exactly is to be seen as jarring. Is it Conan's expressed distaste for a particular type of woman? An odd blanket statement to be sure for modern eyes, and there's more to it based on the story, and it's something that Sterling actually negates in his own story. Might it be when Conan calls Valeria a hussy when he continues to be frustrated by her successful rebuffing of his advances? Jarring to the reader may be Valeria's exclamation, why won't men let me live a man's life? Surely unexpected for the era in which it was written, at least to our own stereotypes of the times. Is it that it's Valeria's masculine attributes that spur Conan's admiration and motivates his dogged pursuit for her attention? That might be jarring to some readers. Is it this expletive harsh in its use, or is it the fact that of the four times it's used in the story, twice are by Valeria and only once by Conan? Might it be this threat of Valeria's to a female attendant? I'm going to strip you stark naked and tie you across the couch and whip you until you tell me what you're doing here and who sent you. Is it the violence in general? If so, you might be reading the wrong book here. Instead of articulating specifics that could be 
fleshed out for the reader to consider, we are primed to scrutinize, to hunt for ghosts, uh, bereft of specifics, but told this is jarring material, we are back to where we began. Free to read, to think about the text as it is, thereby negating the need for the afterwards incantation in the first place, compelling this reader to conclude that the incantation might, after all, just be for show. Well, where does this urge come from, this urge to warn about temporal harm from fictional material? In this oddly polarized moment, it's hard not to see its presence as a result of the current culture war. For surely almost no character could be more of a target than Conan, even if his targeting is unfounded, fostered from ignorance and a knee-jerk reaction to one's own uninvestigated biases against the character. So why is this end page even here? What's it saying? One interpretation is that it's a benign statement, devoid of any real meaning, inserted as a sort of insurance against the iconoclastic hordes. Perhaps a preemptive defense, a way of getting ahead of matters, saying, yeah, we recognize times have changed, things are different, but we may let go and enjoy it, and we're not going to change it. An almost compassionate drawing of a line in the sand. But if integrity was the goal, one would think that no such page would need to have been published. Such incantations can sometimes seem to declare we are progressive. This will preempt further scrutiny or call to censure. That this is our mea culpa and it will exonerate us from any culpability for sins temporal. But it does nothing but grant control to some other person. It accedes it authority to some other under the guise of friendly capitulation. A cynical, though not impossible interpretation or point of consternation that I've seen shared by others online is that it foreshadows a future of Conan pastiche as being necessarily neutered of challenging themes, problematic ideas expunged from future stories. For now, especially since it's presented as an afterword, I'll choose to believe it is a gesture of naive acquiescence, perhaps considered well-intentioned by someone in the publishing realm, to the threat of the neo-puritanical. Though, in times of culture war, it might also be motivated by humility, or by fashion, preservation, or hopefully less likely, by some more authoritarian urge. In an era of luxury beliefs, it's not possible to placate those forces that would seek to appropriate culture for the purpose of colonizing it and sanitizing it. Dismissive silence rather than incantations might be the best way to confront these forces, and it grants absolute respect to the reader's intelligence. Whatever the case, that the incantation be intoned in the first place already accedes authority to some other. Conan's wariness of the civilized world is well-founded, and it truly is a theme that runs through Howard's stories and subsequent tellings. Civilizations that allow tyrants or cultists to rule with nonsensical or superstitious authority, that systematize and prioritize the demonization of temporal or other identity-based sin groups over truth, is a society that will endorse slavery, authoritarianism, and all other manner of depravity. It's a civilization that becomes precarious and requires further authoritarianism and victims to hold it all together. Conan wisely fears such incantations from the priestly class and understands them to be malign sorcery. Until next time, take it easy, you stitching dogs.